Right. We can now begin. I believe you've rested enough. So in this section, I'm going to take you through the basic parts of the brain. The purpose of this is so that our subsequent lectures will then be picking on each of these basic parts of the brain to talk about them. So this is a very important section because it gives us an overall understanding of the different parts of the brain. You know that we've already done the first two. So we're now there. So this is how the brain looks like. We describe the brain as having three parts. That big part outlined by that, which color is that one now? I don't know this purple or blue. I don't know, it's violet or is that purple, whatever it is. So this outline there, this big part is what we call the cerebrum. The one outlined by red is the cerebellum. So this is cerebellum. And then the whole of this is what you call the brainstem. Now, the brainstem has three components. This component of the brainstem from there to there is what you call the midbrain. This region from there to there, this one that is pregnant, is what you call pons. And please note, Pons does not have an R, commonly people add it, I don't know for whatever reason. And then here, this is what you call the medulla oblongata. So there are three parts of the brain stem. But generally the brain has three basic parts, cerebrum, cerebellum, and the brain stem. That is one naming system. And this is the one that we largely use when you're looking at the brain postnatally. However, when you're looking at the brain prenatally, which means the fetal brain, especially when it's developing, we tend to use other terms. Those terms, you may have already come across them. The forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. So let's put some perspective into them. Forebrain, also known as prosencephalon, refers to the cerebrum. So forebrain is the cerebrum. And it's also called prosencephalon. Cephalon refers to brain. You know, cephalic means brain. So if you have forebrain, then we also have midbrain. The other name given to midbrain is mesencephalon. And particularly that is the midbrain as we've already mentioned before. Therefore, it makes sense that the rest is hindbrain as I'd already told you earlier. So when you talk of hindbrain, we are referring to pons, medulla oblongata, and cerebellum. The embryological term given for hindbrain is rhombencephalon. Those are the parts of the brain. Now let's narrow down to the cerebrum. <clears throat> We've agreed that the brain has those three parts, brainstem, cerebrum, and cerebellum. Let's narrow down to this one, cerebrum. The cerebrum has two components. This is what we call the cerebral hemispheres. 
and is what we call the diencephalon. When you talk of cerebral hemispheres, we are referring to these two things, two, these two big things. So we have the right and the left cerebral hemisphere. The other name given to the cerebral hemisphere is telencephalon. Telen, T-E-L-E, telencephalon. It means the cerebral hemispheres. So there's the right and the left hemisphere. And the two hemispheres are joined by this structure here. The structure labeled A is called the corpus callosum. So the right and the left cerebral hemisphere are joined by the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is a group of axons of neurons that connect the right and the left hemisphere. That is the hemisphere, telencephalon. Then you have the dencephalon. The dencephalon refers to this region here, this one only, this part. That is the dencephalon. There are four components of the dencephalon. The part labeled B is what we call the thalamus. The part labeled C is the hypothalamus. This one here is the epithalamus. Although when you use the term epithalamus, it means multiple things. This one particularly is the pineal body or you can call it the pineal gland. So the pineal body is part of the epithalamus, but there are other things which are also components of the epithalamus, not necessarily within our scope. The fourth component of the dencephalon is a transition between thalamus and the midbrain. That transition area is what we call the subthalamus. So we have thalamus, hypothalamus, subthalamus, and epithalamus. Those are components of the dencephalon. One day we'll have a lecture on the dencephalon. Now that aside, let's narrow down to the cerebral hemisphere. So if you are to take a coronal section through the cerebral hemisphere, this is how it will appear. you see some outer region of gray matter. Now, in our introductory lecture, there's a name we gave to the outer layer of gray matter in the CNS. And uh, who is going to remind us now? Uh, Sharon will remind us. Sharon, you're in? Yes. Okay, reminder, Sharon. Pardon the question. What name do we give to this outer layer of gray matter in the brain? Any idea? No. Sorry? No. Okay. So, scholar will remind us. Scholar, you're in? Yes, I'm in. Okay, what name do we give to this outer layer of gray matter in the brain? I have no idea. Okay, Scholar, back to you. What is gray matter? Scholar, what's gray matter? A co collection of cell bodies. Okay, so we are talking about collection of cell bodies of neurons, the periphery of the CNS. Okay, so who remembers the name we gave to a collection of cell bodies of neurons in the periphery of the central nervous system? Anyone? 
Okay, so we have Sarah, you can unmute. It's the cortex. The cortex, great. So because this is in the cerebrum, then we call it cerebral cortex. Please remember that this is the cerebral cortex. That is one component of the hemisphere, the cerebral cortex. The human cerebral cortex is about two to four millimeters thick. It is highly convoluted as we can see. With several faults, the aim of the convolutions is to increase the surface area of the cerebral cortex without necessarily increasing the size of the brain. Because if you are to increase the size of the brain, there are many modifications you have to do to the human race, including even increasing the size of the maternal pelvis, because this that is the part that the head of the baby will have to pass through. If you increase the size of the brain physically, you have to increase the size of the skull, which means that uh, the baby may have some challenges coming out unless you have to then take care of the young for a long period of time after birth. Many implications. So anyway, folding the cerebral cortex is a good idea. Increasing the surface area of the cortex without necessarily increasing the size of the brain, the outer layer of gray matter. Then the inner white matter you can just call the cerebral white matter. So this is the cerebral white matter. Last time we talked about cerebral white matter as having this type of fibers. White matter contain axons of neurons and that there are different types of fibers, projection fibers, association fibers and commissure of fibers. Sarah, Sarah Hope, are you in? Yes. Okay, Sarah. Uh, what are projection fibers, Sarah? I have no idea. Okay. You can mute. Let me give it to Rebecca. <coughs> projection fibers, they lie mm -hmm. in between. I can pretty remember. Okay. Let's try Peter. Okay, there are two Peters here. So Peter Mudike. Peter, you can unmute. Peter Mudike, are you in? Okay, he's not in. Let me remove him. We got to Peter Musioki. Yes. Okay, Peter Musioki. Do you remember what projection fibers are? The uh, fibers that connect uh, the same uh, parts of the same hemisphere of the brain. Not quite, not quite, not quite. Yes. What do you mean parts of the same hemisphere? Like uh, they join, uh, they, 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 they don't cross the hemisphere from one to another. They don't cross the um, same uh, hemisphere. Okay, you people seem to have forgotten what you said. Anyone who remembers what projection fibers are? Okay, so Asma. Okay, Asma, I have to mute you. Yes, uh, I'll talk about your side in a car, ni kama ni motorbike yawa. Okay, let's try uh, Sharon. There are fibers that connect the the inside 
of the cortex to the outside. What do you mean inside the cortex and outside? Yeah, Okay, so they come from the cortex. Well, um, I have just an issue with the term inside the, the cortex. So there are neurons which connect the cerebral cortex to extracortical regions, either from the spinal cord to the cerebral cortex or from brain stem to the cerebral cortex or from cerebral cortex to the brain stem, cerebral cortex to the thalamus cerebral cortex to the spinal cord. Those are projection fibers. They project to and from the cerebral cortex. Association fibers connect different cortical regions within the same hemisphere. And commissural fibers connect similar cortical regions between the right and the left hemisphere. Have those definitions at your fingertips. As we go through neuroanatomy, you don't have a choice about those ones. So that is what is contained within the cerebral white matter. There are those fibers which are projection. And a good example for projection fiber is this one, stud. That one is called the internal capsule. The internal capsule is an example of a projection fiber. You know it from today onwards. It's called the internal capsule. Example of commissural fiber is this big one, which we have called earlier the corpus callosum. This is the largest commissural fiber. As we go through neuroanatomy, I'll show you examples of association fibers. The third component of the hemisphere is this region here, the gray matter within the white matter of the hemisphere. We call it the basal ganglia. It should be called basal nuclei, but we commonly call it basal ganglia. The term ganglia is a misnomer and misleading, but that is how we'll be calling it subsequently because that's a conventional name the basal ganglia or the basal nuclei. It refers to a group of cell bodies of neurons at the base of the hemisphere. One day we'll look at them, we'll talk about their functions. For now, let's narrow down to this one, the cerebral cortex. This is how the surface of the cerebral cortex looks like, highly convoluted. So we have elevations and depressions. The elevations are called gyri. It means the ridges. The depressions are called sulci. It means the furrows. You may not believe, but all these gyri have names. And all those sulci have names. However, I don't expect of you to know all the gyri and all the sulci of the cerebral cortex, not for your level, but I'll be highlighting to you the things that you need to know. The purpose of the folds of the cerebral cortex is so that we can increase the surface area of the cerebral cortex without necessarily increasing the overall size of the brain. There are two or three important sulci that I want you to know. The sulcus labeled A is called the lateral sulcus. The person who discovered it or de described it is called Sylvia. And so we commonly call it the Sylvian fissure. The term fissure is used to just refer to a deep sulcus. So this is the sylvian fissure, otherwise known as the lateral sulcus. Then this one here is another one called the central sulcus. The central sulcus was described by someone called Rolando. And so we call this the Rolandic sulcus. With the presence of Rolandic sulcus there, 
and the presence of the lateral sulcus here, we divide the cerebral cortex into lobes. The lobe in front of the central sulcus is called the frontal lobe. The lobe behind the central sulcus is called the parietal lobe. The lobe inferior to the lateral sulcus is called the temporal lobe. For you to define the occipital lobe, you will have to look at it from the other side. You see, the surface of the brain we are looking at right now is a lateral surface of the brain. There are two points here to pick. If you move from here, you come like this, there's a notch there. We call that the preoccipital notch. So have that as one point. Again, if you follow this other part, there's a notch there. We call that the parato-occipital notch. So we join the parato-occipital notch with the pre-occipital notch. Then we define the fourth lobe of the brain, which is the occipital lobe. So on the middle aspect, the parato-occipital notch is this one, but we see that it's actually an extension of a very big sulcus on the middle aspect, which we call the paratoccipital sulcus. So the paratoccipital sulcus helps us to define also the occipital lobe. So this is the occipital lobe. I've already shown you the other two lobes. So in simple terms, the cerebral cortex is divided into lobes, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and occipital lobe. This is how the brain would look like in an MRI image. So that is the cerebellum. This is the brain stem. That's the corpus callosum. So this is the hemisphere. This is the pituitary gland actually. In terms of the brainstem, this is the midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. This is the region we are calling the dencephalon with thalamus up and hypothalamus below. This image shows us an axial section through the brain. And these are the basal ganglia. This is thalamus. We can see the way the cerebral cortex is highly convoluted. These are the images that show us the same concept. That's the corpus callosum. This is the internal capsule. That's the thalamus. So let's make a summary of what you've said. Brain has three parts. Brainstem, cerebrum, and cerebellum. The cerebrum has two components, the hemisphere, and the dencephalon. The hemisphere has the following, the white matter, which can be commissural association and projection fibers. The cerebral cortex has lobes, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. One day we'll talk about the basal ganglia. We'll also talk about the dencephalon. Even these ones, we'll talk about them one day. Histologically, this is how the cerebral cortex looks like. When you look at it, it is highly cellular. The cerebral cortex is highly cellular. When you look at it keenly, you notice that uh, the cells in this zone are actually smaller than the cells in this zone. And there's some gradual increase in size of the cells. Also, if you look at skin, you realize that this zone here is largely lacking the blue, those blue at the axonal fibers, and they're more on this side. So there's some zonations. Usually, there are some six zones of the cerebral cortex, but we'll talk about that next week when you look at now the cerebral cortex. So 
thank you very much. That's the story of how the brain is divided. So our next topic will be functional localization of the cerebral cortex, which means we'll be looking at which part of the cerebral cortex performs which function. I'll stop there for today.